Hello, everyone. I want to admit, uh, have everyone go ahead and mute, please, on the bottom left. And welcome to another Elk Talk. We are uh, fortunate to have Dr. U, Dr. Nagasaki joining us. And um, Dr. Nagasaki and Dr. U, you got to unmute. You see it? There you go. And uh, so first of all, I want a couple things, a couple announcements. Next week's Elk Talk starts at five o'clock. Um, we have some uh, Dr. Uh, Salman joining us from Australia, which is very uh, incredible that he's willing to join us on his Monday. Um, so please uh, note that we are recording. Uh, please mute. And I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. And uh, so please answer this question. What medication are you currently taking? All right, I'm going to end the poll, share the results. Elected is at 63%, and then we got lorlatinib is at 14%, vernatinib is at 8%, and 2% uh, of us have taken chemotherapy. And I'll close that poll. What's your length of your diagnosis? I'm going to end this poll, share the results. One to two years is at 40%. Uh, one year and under is at 15%. Three to four years is at 22%. And um, go to the next polling question. Um, if you have progressed, what is the area of progression? All right, I'm gonna end this one. Number one progression was in, in the brain at 22%. And then we have lymph nodes and bone and primary location was at 10%. So I'm gonna end the polling and turn it over to Gina. There you go, Gina, it's yours. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it's so great to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming on a Sunday night. We have an amazing guest, an ALK expert, and just a, some total rock stars on the call. So I'm so excited um, that they can be with us. I was going to make a few announcements first for ALK Positive. Uh, we are really needing some volunteers. So if you love research, give us an email at info at alkpositive.org. We're looking for some people to help us build up our ALK positive uh, research library. So if that's something you might be interested in volunteering in, we would love to have you. Um, that's info at alkpositive.org if you're interested. Uh, Colin Barton is working on our ALK research library. And if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out. If you just go to alkpositive.org and hit the button that says research, you can find out everything there is to find out ALK. So it's really exciting stuff coming up. And speaking of research, ALK Positive has had some really incredible donors uh, donate for the salary of a director of research. And so we're in the process of hiring a director of research that is just focused on ALK Positive research. So you can be sure whenever you're fundraising that you can fundraise for the absolute best research. Our research and review panel, which is made of patients and caregivers, um, all work really hard to make sure we're um, funding the most impactful research. So we're excited to be a part of that. We're excited about the new things that are coming down the pipeline. And if you 
you remember, November 1st is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. So we're going to be having a big push to fund out positive research. And we're really, really excited about the things that we can do um, together as a group. We know that we are stronger together and that when we work together, we can make some really, really impactful um, research decisions and uh, uh, fund really impactful research. Well, today we have Dr. Ignatius Liu. I'm sure you have heard of him before. Um, he is really an Alc rec, uh, uh, Alc rock star and has been a part of uh, really the Alc journey from the very beginning. He was one of the first PIs on uh, Crizotinib, which is the very first Alc uh, TKI in or Alc inhibitor, which is the targeted therapy. And um, I would just love to hand it over to him. But we just want to know first. First of all, Dr. Ayo, everybody is excited to meet you. We want to kind of know a little bit about you and what brought you to studying ALK. All right, you want to tell them something? I, they ask us everyone to mute. Uh, oh, so I, I, okay, so I, I mean, I, it's it's very I'm very glad everybody is uh, so many people are on. Um, it, I was just a young, aimless attending, and uh, that was in 2007. I was looking for a MAD inhibitor because I was uh, our university has lost an attending, so I was also doing gastric cancer. And I traveled down to La Jolla, which is only about an hour from where I, where I work and live. And, and I, the, the team introduced me to the Chris Alternate team, a Pfizer, a Citadel team introduced me to Chris Alternate team. And um, they had all the phase one site chosen, but they don't have one in the West Coast. And I back and got Chris Alternate. There was two and seven before even published the all positive lung cancer paper in nature i mean i i consider this journey like a forest gum i was just at the right time you know at the right you know right place at the right time um and i and i very you know i always look back i was going to leave uci and go to mayo scottsdale i got the offer in 2008 the product the pro the protocol was not even approved in UCI yet. At that time, it took 15 months. Um, but for whatever reason, I stayed. We opened the trial. I wasn't paying attention. But then I heard from the grapevine, you know, um, the, the call, the PI call was four o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday. So it's about seven o'clock in Korea in the morning and also in Australia. And then I heard something, oh, they may find something in lung cancer. I was a lung cancer person and I had a neck person. And then I just, okay, let me let me listen on. And then the rest is history. We were able to get alactinib. We were able to get loratinib. And so I was able to start this journey. So I have my, I have my heartbreak of patients who pass, uh, you know, because when we were had chrysotinib, we have miracles, but we could not, you know, sustain the miracle. Patients progress in the brain. And it was very, um, so all the way to Lolatinib that a point that I think um, very, very fortunate. And also um, we need to keep pushing the envelope. So that's my story. There's nothing there. I wasn't looking. It was, I wasn't looking. I got the trial. I have no idea what it is. I was going to leave, and then I stay at UCI. The trial got open, and and then we found out that oh, it works on all positive lung cancer, and the rest is history. <laughs> well, we sure are glad you were in the right place at the right time. <laughs> so I will um, I will share my screen. I have about twenty slides. I'm a little bit biased. I am. Uh, uh, I think I have, uh, you know, my own advocacy, the, the fact that Dr. Shaw is now in industry, I feel like I need to carry the torch to, um, you know, do some advocacy. So I will, I will show my, uh, my screen here and I will, let me see, I will, 
so this is the this is just the first slide uh, let me let me go so i saw the survey that uh, many of the patients many of the audience are just diagnosed within the first one to two years um, this is a very important paper to show that the all positive non so lung cancer patients um, had very good survival close to about 10 years. And this is only from crisotinib to the second generation inhibitor. I think we now don't use crisotinib anymore. Um, so I think we should, the survival is, is longer. Now, survival doesn't mean you just, you know, crawl to the finish line per se. The survival means you need to be running all the time. You should be active. You should not just be uh, extending the number, you have to extend the quality of, of the, of the numbers too. So sometimes when I listen to professor Ross Kamich talk and he say, you know, what is the point, what is the goal of treating all positive non sponsor lung cancer? The key is not just maintaining, you know, as long as you can, but also quality. And you can't just sequence one to the other to get to that point and that you achieve the goal. But regardless, when I first see a patient, I mean, I'm looking at 10 years, you know, I need to be able to do this for, you know, keep at least 10 years and hopefully we can break, have the breakthrough. This is not your stage four lung cancer. Um, you know, you just, you know, when we were, when I first came out, it's about under one year. So this is an important, uh, hopefully they update this. This is from the French intergroup in 2017. I'm sure the lumber is uh, even better. Um, a little bit about the variant since uh, I was asked to talk about a little bit about the variant. The variant is a little bit uh, more, I think, sophisticated look at uh, the uh, outpositive on sports so lung cancer. It is the data to show that it is not one disease. So EML4 ALK is the primary variant in this uh, type of lung cancer. It is uh, about 85% of the all positive non small cell lung cancer has EML4 uh, ALK. You can see that the variant are initially named by the order they were discovered. So Professor Mano discovered variant one and variant two in the same paper in Nature. And then variant three was discovered the next year. It is shorter or it is less bulky, whatever 2D or 3D representation. It is actually more stable because it's bulkier, it's more stable, it's more resistant to ALK inhibitors. And then you have the other variants. Variant five is even shorter or in, and also bulk. Uh, bulky and also bulky and stable. Now, during the development of all the all, all the inhibitors, the, the method of diagnosis is by fish or immunohistochemistry. I understand that was the original methods, but those two methods do not tell you uh, what your variants are. And I think it's important as we as we get into the second and the third decade of this disease, you know, we cannot just rest on six ALK inhibitors and we have achieved something. We have to push and push and push. So we need to, I know most now are doing uh, next generation sequencing. We, we don't take treatment according to the variant at this point, but we have to have the treating physicians at least have to have some idea that if you have a variant free, you are at a higher uh, risk of relapse. The, the progression free survival is shorter than if you have variant one. So those are things that the treating physician needs to be aware of and at least um, you know, have a plan ahead. This is the, this is the uh, pie chart. This is from two major uh, registry that shows that variant one and variant three each each constitute about 35 to 40 percent of the of the uh, of the uh, EML4 positive lung cancer. And you have a lot of other variants that you know it's 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 
uh, it's important. We don't know. Not many people are paying much attention. Uh, you know, if they are paying attention, it's variant one and variant three. So these are the NCCN guidelines. Um, so three of the uh, ALK inhibitors have the category one. And so you, but one is better than the other two. And I have to say that, and you cannot just say, well, you can pick one of the two, one of the three, and you can sequence and all that. And I'll argue that loratinib is the best among the three. We've lost our sound. Can you hear me? I hear you, but I can't hear the speaker. Okay. Dr. Yeah, I can hear you. Did Dr. Nagasaki can take over. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Crystal. There you are. We couldn't hear you for a minute. Sorry about that. No, that's... um. Yeah, we lost sound with Dr. Nagasaki, um, Dr. U. Is Dr. Nagasaki here? So I am, I am back on. So oh, you're back. I, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, just, um, let me share my screen. Okay. Again. Um, so I will go a little bit. I'll go a little bit faster. So this is the work from Dr. Christine Lovely. I am only looking at the wild type, the original arc. You can see just by using this plot, variant one is much more sensitive to variant three. And if you look at all six inhibitor, you don't even see the line of lolatinib uh, on the variant one and you see a blip of that on the variant free uh, for the green. So it's important, um, I think for reference and hopefully in the future, we have something that can target variant free specifically. It may be a while, but um, at least be aware of it is important. We had a few questions specifically on the variants, Dr. Yu. One yes. was, what does it mean if you have a variant 3A and a 3B or EML4 out? What, like, what is the difference and, and what does it even mean? So right now, ah, that's a great question. We don't, we, 3A and 3B, I think coexist in the majority of the samples. So there's a paper coming out that shows that variant uh, oh, so, so if you have a variant free, you have both free A and free B in the tumor, but free B is more sensitive than free A. And the paper we were commenting on is that free A, as during treatment, you get more free A than free B. So you get more resistant, more of the resistant clone of free A. Now we don't know whether this is this is just one paper, whether this is generalized or not. And the, v, the, the difference between v, free A and free B is, is a different splicing. So we are proposing to target splicing as part of the treatment in the future. Um, that, that, is, that is a lot of theory, but, uh, but free A and free B coexist in most of the cases. And, and right now the commercial technology usually do, in the tumor, you can detect either free or free B or both. In the liquid, I think it's harder. Um, but right now, it doesn't make any, any difference at this point. So it's a very scientific look at it, but it's, it doesn't affect the day-to-day -day clinical decision at this point. And hopefully, we, we will, it, will, it will be important in the future. Here is just to show um, now looking at the inhibitors that loratinib is the best by the, in, by the IC50. So I know uh, a lot of you may be skipping the NFL to, to join this. So you, this is what we call 
measurables. So they are non-measurables and measurables. So the New York Jets lost today in London. They have a great, you know, Zach Wilson as the new quarterback, has a lot of good measurables. But being a quarterback also have non-measurables. But in law alternative, the measurables are the best among the six, whether it's variant one or variant three, you can see here the numbers. And this is from Dr. Christine Lovely's uh, paper. So it's, it's not something that we made up. It's from her study. We just abstract the uh, numbers and uh, basically do a high school project of a bar chart side by side. And that's, that's the number. You can see Chris Alton, it was, uh, it was good from the very beginning, but right now nobody you know, really rarely uses um, Chris Alton up front. And this is just the comparison of the studies, uh, the hazard ratios. If you just look at the data objectively, um, whether you have patients, overall patients, with brain, without brain meds or with brain meds, the green loratinib is the best so far. And we, if you want to look at progression-free survival, loratinib is not rich at this point, but it's, I think, more than 33 months, the longest of them. Uh, here is a color matrix. So this is look at the subgroup analysis of the four major trials, alectinib, and brigatinib, and sartinib, and loratinib. You can see the subgroup analysis, whether you're male, female, age, brain meds or no brain meds, performance status, whether you smoke, whether you had chemo or no chemo, uh, loratinib trial, all the subgroup analysis, it's green, it's positive, positive for loratinib. Uh, some, of, some of the other trials have one or two subgroups that are not positive. Wh whatever that means, you know, doesn't really matter maybe whether you have active smoker, it doesn't work. There are rare numbers, but still, if you really want to look at comparisons, you like, you like your compound to be green on all the subgroups that is, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, available. And if you look at Ansartanib, they just published their paper in JAMA Oncology, patients with brain meds, it's actually not positive for progression-free survival benefit, which is a little bit surprising uh, in that case. But it's not in the US, so it's not, it's not important at this point, but this is how I look at it. You, you just do the color matrix, you show it, this is, you know, and then you can make your own interpretation how you look at a compound. So this is just the uh, subgroup analysis on the New England Journal for Crown. This is an important graph. This is a graph that is from uh, Dr. Alex Trelon from Memorial Stone Kettering and Dr. Uh, Jessica Lin from Mass General. They were looking at the incidence of brain match over time for red positive uh, lung cancer, fusion positive lung cancer. And they, that's the idea, but they use a comparison of ROS1 and all. So you can see the black line is the cumulative incidence of brain metastasis over time in all positive non cell lung cancer. It is the highest among the three common uh, receptor ties in kinase fusion. And that's, I think, um, it's important for the clinician to know because if you, if you have this idea and you have treat patients, you know, you know very, I'm very lucky to treat, started treating you know, in 2008 all the way to now, you, you, you realize, you know, brain metastasis is a, it's a, it's a uh, challenge. As it's, a PI, you know, do you think that they're taking that into account when it comes to like out positive um, clinical trials and things like that? Since you can see out positive patients are the most likely to get brain metastasis. Do you think they're taking that into consideration when they're looking at like uh, clinical trial um, enrollment and things like that? Not, not in the clinical trial enrollment, but in the design. And patients have, so I'll have a few designs for you to look at. So it's like, you, you, whether you like it or not, and you can talk to the companies. It's very important for, for, for the clinician to pick the one that will prevent the brain metastasis. I mean, 
Pfizer's message is we have the best drug against patients with brain metastasis. It's very hard to interpret the data because brigatinib is good, alactinib is good, and then sartinib is good too. But for, for patients without brain metastasis, and this is where I want to show, is that you know Dr. Solomon will be on the paper that got, a, got submitted to um, General Clinical Oncology. I don't know the fate yet. It was submitted about two weeks ago. So if the majority of the patients with all positive non small cell lung cancer do not have brain metastasis at the time of diagnosis, about 60 to 70%. So one of the tasks of the drug is to prevent it from coming uh, to, to have brain metastasis. So this is the loratinib. This is all commas uh, in the New England Journal paper is 2.8%. It's lower than alactinib. So I, it is very good. But in patients without brain metastasis, it's actually 1%. Um, this data is now submitted. Hopefully it'll get accepted so we can publicly uh, look at it. Brigatinib is 1%. So brigatinib is also very good in preventing patients without brain metastasis. Um, so instead of 60% at six year, you're looking at 1% at 12 months. I presented this data and Tony Mock said, well, you know, it's only one, one year. You cannot, you know, they didn't follow up. So actually, loratinib is following up on that. Uh, so Dr. Solomon, they don't have the data, but this is being followed up. The, the criticism was you cannot use one year data to extrapolate to the others. The way I look at it, it there is no, there's no reason why it suddenly would go up. The trend is going to be the trend because the drug is going to be the same. So it's 4.6% for lactinib in the Alex trial is 1% for lactinib in the Crown trial. So six, you know, just, just for the sake of argument, it may be 6% at six years versus 60% at six years. Now the math, of course, you know, you can always criticize it. It's unknown, but we need to look at the trend. We need to have our own, you know, the world is unknown, but we need to have a, a feeling of what the unknown will be. So this is, this is very important data. Brigatinib can also achieve that. So I'm not saying just loratinib. That's so the after, number. That's the number that has been published. I'm just, just correlating the numbers. And that's very important. Um, from that data then, so you, 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 you typically in practice use loratinib first line then? Yes, I would say yes. I don't see a lot of... Um, the first line indication was just approved uh, last year, shortly last year. So I don't see a lot of newly diagnosed or all positive on small cell lung cancer yet. But I would, especially if they start on alactinib early, I may even switch them to loratinib. Uh, because you're looking at 10 years, you're looking at 20 years. And, and, and um, you know, we try to go for, go for the, you know, go for broke, go for, uh, you know, 20, 30 years. That's, that's the way I look at it. We, I don't want to use the word cure, but we try to prevent this with, with drugs like this, that, we, that some patients do very well. So this is now the conventional wisdom of how we look at all inhibitors. You have the second generation and the third generation. So I don't like this classification anymore because it gives you the impression that we should go from the second to the third generation, but functionally, all, of, all you know, not counting resortinib, all of these ARC inhibitors can only inhibit one ARC mutations. They cannot inhibit compound mutations. And this is what we put in here, uh, a case report on a patient who had a G1202R and then was got, uh, put on loratinib and eventually had a double mutations. And I just kind of look and see, you know, I did Alice Shaw's group in Mass General has reported, you know, the earliest and also the most number of uh, double mutations. So we did a literature search and see what are the double mutations published. A lot of them have the solvent front mutations followed by an other resistant mutations. And all of these mutations will knock out loratinib. So, you so when you 
start loratinib in the presence of a mutations already, uh, it's very hard for the drug to perform because you know, they're already at a disadvantage. It is different than starting a drug without a inhibitor, uh, without a mutation first. So this is just something that um, there are lots of mutations. If you sequence, we may have to sequence, that's the way it is uh, at this point. But nonetheless, you try to not develop the first mutation. That's the key, because once you have the first mutation, the second mutation will come uh, much faster. And it's just because it's you know you can't in, you can't expect a compound to to tackle a existing mutations uh, at this point. So what what is happening now is that there are two companies uh, that is developing a four what we call uh, a fourth generation or I would call a double mutant active. So all of these are active against a single ARC mutation. This is active against a uh, a battery of double mutations uh, on the same on the same uh, allele. So we have the trial open TPX one three one. Nuvaden is the compound that will probably come to the market uh, come to the clinical trial next year. Uh, they'll probably have to get their uh, paperwork done probably early to uh, next year to start. So those are very good uh, for patients. Uh, hopefully they'll loosen the entry criteria so people can uh, benefit because right now a lot of patients are going sequencing, you know, maybe from chrysotinib to, to alactinib to loratinib or alactinib to loratinib or maybe alactinib to brigatinib to loratinib. So uh, the, the entry criteria is a little bit tougher for TPX0131. I understand what they want to do. Now, so regardless of whether the drug got an accelerated approval or not, that they have to run a phase three trial. Uh, this is just the FDA requirement to, you know, and also important for the Europe and, uh, and Asia. So this is one trial design, you go an upfront treatment. I doubt they will adopt this because this takes a lot of money. Uh, when you supply a lactinib, let's just say the PFS is 26 months progression free survival. You need about 250 patients in each arm because the, bent, the incremental uh, increase is going to be, you know, six months is, you know, you are looking at about from, the, from uh, 28 to 34 to 50 to 35 to 42 months. It's, a, it's, it's very hard to ask for the fourth generation to work but also you have to supply the drugs. Now, right now, there, there, is, there seems to be no difference. You can use a lactinib or a lactinib. Hopefully when the crown data show, uh, is mature and it shows that the PFS is longer than 25.8, let's say 10 months longer, then this, this should not be a choice uh, at this point. We don't know yet because the, the numbers are not out. Now you can say you can't compare trial to trial but this is what we do all the time you know this is what we do all the time so um and 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 so we shall see now this is this is going to be a very tough trial to to uh, enroll because you the drug itself for the comparison now will cost about 100 million dollars uh if you buy them at retail price and that's the competitor has to do here is another design. You know, this is the approved alactinib to loratinib. Alactinib has PFS of about progression-free survival about 25.6 months. Loratinib in the second line setting is about five to six months. So if you look at 26 plus seven is about 33 months. So this, this arm will get you about 33 months. If loratinib is used as an upfront treatment, it is, it is going to be more than 33 months. I, I think the curve, the trend of the curve is going to go to about 33 to 30, at least 35 months. But this will be one of the- Dr. U that you typically start them on lorlatinib now that it has been FDA approved? Yes, over? if I if I have a chance, yes, yes. And then would you switch them from, if, they, if you already started them on electinib, would you switch them to lorlatinib? Uh, depends depending on the timing, depending on the timing. So this is a very, 
controversial and you have to be so i just switched somebody on that and she was she was 34 when she was diagnosed and that was around um july of this year and they put an alert in it as a good response my feeling is we you know i, I switch her i talk to her and say you know i think Loratinib can get you longer. You don't want to wait too long before lactinib before they develop resistance to lactinib to switch. Is it a right or wrong? I don't know. If you have if you have been on lactinib for a year or two, then I won't switch because I don't think that. Uh, but if if I have a chance to start somebody very early on or fresh up, I would do lactinib. So this is all clinical judgment. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, that's the way I, I look at it. If if it's within the first few months of diagnosis, you know it all depends on uh, on the on the circumstances. This patient is young, is thirty four years old, and so I say, you know, let's let's try this. And you know, she doesn't have any brain mat, so I say, you know, that's that's what I I would do it because I don't want to wait until because if you if you look at the data it's 4.6 months 4.6 percent for every 12 months for alactinib and one percent for loratinib so if you're young your chance of it increases every every year with alactinib versus loratinib that's my rationale um you know we we shall see but this this design is this is how they will develop the fourth generation, so lactin and loratin. Unless, unless loratin is in crown, it's let's say 30, 35 months, 36 months. Then if you add a lactin to loratin, it's still shorter than upfront loratin, then they may have to consider that. The problem is there is really no, no pushback at this point uh, in terms of this design because we don't know the PFS progression-free survival of loratinib. Let's say loratinib when they report is 36 months. So it's 11 months, it's 10 months better than alactinib in, 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 uh, in Alex's uh, trial. What would people do? You know, is that enough convincing that they should use loratinib rather than alactinib? We don't know, but the trial design is different. It's artificial, you all know that. They don't consider, they have to, they have to beat up something. They can't just say, you know, approve it based on based on science. They have to beat something up. And so this will be one way that they will be offered. Whether they are better than loratinib, I don't actually know, because if you look at the data, I mean, they may be better than loratinib um, at this at, as a second line treatment, but then it, it beats the purpose of developing a fourth generation double mutant positive uh, uh, the inhibitors but those are those are this is the second design you think about it uh, because they have to do a randomized phase three trial so when you think about that do you, would you mind going back to that slide so we have we have our option of either like the the fourth line generation which tpx 131 which is you know we've we've heard some side effects on that one but we also have the nuvalent drug which is 655 um versus lorlatinib what like what do we do if we have progressed on lorlatinib we have the tpx right as an option or nuvalent as an option or are there other options too like um, for, for us as patients, uh, like chemotherapy combined with your lorlatinib. Yes, chemotherapy combined with lorlatinib is, is definitely, we, I do it all the time. I shouldn't say that in recorded, but I think most people do it too, and it's just not me. You know, we combine, I have combined chemotherapy with all the approved uh, ARC inhibitors. Um, not just the first line, but also with uh, docetaxel, Cyrems as the second line, Remsirumab as the second line. But there comes a time when even they break through after the chemotherapy. You know, I give about four to four cycles, and then they, and then the disease continues to progress. Because I have patients now been treated for six years, ten years, and. What happens is once you develop resistance, it's it's very hard to control. Right. So there are the there are the there are the treatment options. You know, I was just talking to Dr. Nakasaka today in the hospital. I mean, 
we could try a uh, antibody drug conjugate. That's that's something that um, nobody, you know, people may explore in the future. You have to use combination. So this is, if you have an off-target resistant mutation, if, if you have a MET amplification, then you're not the fourth generation or the double mutant uh, TKI is not going to be active. You have to combine it with, you know, a uh, MET inhibitor, you know, off-label, but that's that's very rational combination. It's it's. I don't think uh, people can say this is the wrong approach. If you have a MET amplification, you have to combine it with a MET in MET inhibitor, or now with the approval of Amy Vantamap, consider a uh, uh, antibody, uh, MET antibody off-label. So we are using a lot of off-label treatments that, you know, I don't think it's just me. I think everybody who treats a lot of uh, all positive non sponsor lung cancer patients from the very beginning, you know, 10 years, 12 years, you are, you are, you know, even five, six years, you, you have to use something else. Um, and is there ever an opportunity to use immunotherapy or IO without positive patients? Well, if you look at the InPower 150 trial, um, they do they do say that uh, there is some benefit. So if you look at the numbers, they are a little bit better with uh, you know the InPower uh, regimen, uh, carboplatin, paclitaxel, bevacizumab, and atezolizumab. It is approved in, in a European Union, this regimen. Uh, I tend not to take the ALK inhibitor away because of the need to prevent brain metastases. So combining a, a ALK inhibitor and immunotherapy, sometimes you get autoimmune uh, disease and, and you know, uh, activation of uh, hepatitis, of, uh, of a myelosuppression. So I tend not to use that. Uh, with immunotherapy at this point, I'm a, I'm a little bit biased on that, but they are definitely because I want to continue the the ALK TKI. If I don't continue ALK TKI, yes, you can, you can use uh, chemo plus immunotherapy. But the problem is once you take the TKI out, then the then the suppressing the brain metastasis uh, function is gone. The ability to suppress using chemo is much lower than using an ALK inhibitor. So you're stuck with continuing the ALK inhibitor and adding something to it according to what, uh, you know, chemo, other, other off-label TKI, uh, according to the resistant pattern. And also maybe now if you have double mutations, you go on to the, the double mutant positive uh, uh, inhibitors. So this is my last design. This is the third line design. This is the most scientific or rational design. The, the, the drawback is it limits the market share of the, of the compound. And so I don't think companies, you know, they have, you know, they may not be like, they may not like to adopt this design because they don't get into a, a lot of uh, patients. But this is, or, or, or at a very late line. So this is what we usually do now. You know, you take one of your, uh, ALK inhibitors, you can pick resorthinib too. Um, you know, this is a this will be a global study. We we go outside US, you can still have resorthinib, and then you have a uh, whatever you choose, and then you check for mu double mutants in the blood. If you find a double mutant, you randomize to what is the drug is actually designed for. Uh, Versus here, I use the uh, immunotherapy regimen because if you are going to run this trial in Europe, this regimen is approved in Europe. Or you can use the standard platinum pemetrexid. So chemo versus a inhibitor. Now, I, I'm not sure patients want to be randomized to this because you have to take the patients off the TKI. Uh, but this is a clinical trial and it, and it has to be done that way. You know, it's... And so that's, a, that's the, that's the non-reality of clinical trial is you, you really, you know, you really don't want to take out, take off the TKI, but this is, this is what happens when you have to run a trial. They, they are not approved. I think FDA will have no problems with uh, platinum pemetrexid that has been proven to be, to work. European will, will not have, you know, will probably require the Impar 150 as part of the uh, regimen. 
And then on progression, you randomize so that there's crossover and patients can benefit that. Now, this is the most ideal design, I would say. Whether this will be adopted by either one of the two companies, I, I, I doubt that because you are, you're limited the drugs to a double mutant situation and you are in a third line situation. But this is just a mental exercise. You think about that and so, and then you, you realize how they design the trial would, will actually affect how the field is being treated. Even though if I use a two to one randomization, more patients get the drug than, than uh, they're not. Now, I think in the US it will be different because I assume this will be, both drugs will be approved, at least accelerated approval while the trial is being done. But, but as, a global, as a global process, this is still, um, this is how you would have to get the drug approved, the design. So my feeling is the second line is probably the best. The problem is in two years time, is olactinib to loratinib the right choice? Because when the crown, if the crown data comes out and it says 10 months, and let's say loratinib is seven months here and, and this one is 10 months. So 10 plus 26 is equals to the median progression free survival of first line loratinib. Then you're gonna have a dilemma. Now this is, so this way, this cannot change, but this is how I, I look at it uh, at this point. And so I'll stop here, take up enough time already. Uh, well, we appreciate it and all of the information that you, you've given too. Um, a few things that um, we can see on that, and one of those is exactly what you're talking about with the clinical trial design. We see that, you know, patients who have been on ALK-targeted therapies for quite a while, some three or four years or more, um, when they have the washout period are typically um, experiencing some pretty bad side effects. And so do you ever think that that might be something that we remove from clinical trial um, design is that washout period? Um, the washout period will probably have to stay. Uh at least for about five to seven, seven days. So we, when I, when I, I wrote the uh, repotractinib protocol for TP. So I, I, at that time I, I didn't do a washout. So he actually tells you which inhibitor is in, in uh, is a inhibitor, which ARC inhibitor is a inducer and which ARC inhibitor is inert. So we know that chrysotin and brigatinib is an inhibitor. So if you, don't wash out brigatinib or chrysotinib and you take a pill, the, the level of that pill will go up. So you get more side effects. So you have to wash out for about seven days. Alactinib is very inert. If you don't wash it out, it doesn't affect what you take subsequently. Loratinib is the exact opposite. If you take loratinib and you, wash, and you don't wash out, it actually reduces the level of whatever you take next. So you actually get a, a false sense of security if you go from loratinib to drug X, because that level will drop and you actually don't see side effects and you, get, you can fool yourself into thinking, oh, this drug is so tolerable. So maybe five days, five days to seven days, it is unavoidable, unfortunately, um, that you have to wash out, but you don't do it for 12 weeks, so 12, 14 days. I mean, I... When I was doing the alactinib trial, they had to wash out 14 days. I mean, I don't want to, you know, we have patients die right before they're ready to start because that 14 day washout is, is just horrible. I cannot keep them, you know, that the flare is too much. And, and I, you know, five days would probably be the, you know, in real life, we don't do it. In real life, we, we don't do it. Even in brigatinib, if you go from chrysotin to brigatinib, there is, the FDA does not require you to wash out chrysotinib, even though chrysotinib will induce the, will increase the level of brigatinib because it's a CIFRI-A4 inhibitor. But, but in clinical trial, yes, they have, you, have to, you have to wash out, I would say five days at most. That makes sense. There's a lot of people who just can't handle the no. washout and who aren't actually making it to even the TPX clinical trial just because they can't handle the washout. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that we think is sad. We can't even test the drug because of a drug flare or anything like that. So I was just wondering if that's something that may 
be considered, but I understand the rationale of why um, you're thinking. Well, you, you can talk to the company to say five days, you know, a compromise, <clears throat> five days and not seven days, not 14 days. Uh, when we did the chrysotinib, uh, phase one or the electin, the chrysotinib phase one, we have to dose one dose and then stop for seven days and then start. So we not only have to wash up, but we have to only do one dose. And that seven days, we lose a few patients because of, of that one dose, day minus seven, and then they want to do the, the day one. So that's another uh, situation. So you don't, you don't want the day minus seven, you want the day minus three and that's it. There's no reason why you can't formulate your PK after three days. So I would do day minus day minus three, and then you go ahead. You can't do day minus seven. Otherwise, your one dose is not going to hold a patient for the next week without any treatment. Yeah, I like that way better than the 14 days. <laughs> that no, makes me way happier. Yeah, we have uh, so we know that you like uh, lorlatinib first line. So, um, and, and it seems like there is a much higher progression-free survival with lorlatinib first line. So I guess the question for most of us, and I, I, tell, I, I think you may have seen that most people on this call are on electinib now. So, you know, there's a little bit of a fear of switching over to lorlatinib because it, first, if you do lorlatinib first line, what, what's next? Can't hear you yet. Oh, sorry about the connection. Um, there you are. <laughs> so Dr. Katayama has a paper that shows that the one of the resistant mutation that will come out if you use lactin up front can be inhibited by lactin. So the difference is right now we use lactin as the second line. So all you see all the elegant results are double mutations, you know, off target. But if you use lorlatinib, if you have an on target resistant mutation, it will be a single mutation. It will probably be a lactinib, uh, sensitive to a lactinib. I think you can now go on to the TPX131 trial or hopefully soon the New Valent trial. This day, I mean, you know, I also talked to my colleagues about how to design the new valent trial too, since, you know, no, I just, I think they need, they need to be patient, patient friendly. And, and, and also half the time people don't listen to me anyway. So I offer whatever you, know, you can do, whatever you want. Uh, Please keep, keep asking, keep asking for us. And we are too, we're advocating for, uh, you know, some, some other things when it comes to TPX, as far as uh, the number of targeted therapies and things like that. Uh, as a patient group, we want to be loud because we want the most amount of people to be eligible for accrual for our clinical trial, because we know when that clinical trial succeeds then we do too and then we get new drugs so um that you know anything else that we can as a group work together um, to advocate for please let us know yeah right now there is no approved therapy post brigatinib there is no approved therapy post loratinib as first line the fda has no approved therapy well you can use loratinib you can use other but by the, by the government definition, there is no, there is nothing approved post brigatinib first line. There's nothing approved post loratinib first line. And, and that's, um, that's, that's why I think the other company can, can develop that. Uh, well, you say, well, you can sequence. Yeah, but, you know, the drug development is different. So, I mean, it's like vaccine. We all know that, you know. The, gut, the FDA has to go through paperwork to approve this, approve that, you know, booster shot, that and that, you know, there's no, right now, Moderna has no boosters you know, available, Johnson, John, no booster available. We all know they're going to work, you know, whether you, you know, you believe it, but that's, that's government paperwork. So that's why, um, you know, if they can develop a, that's an opening for all the companies to develop a post loratinib or a post brigatinib treatment. Because right now, only post-alactinib has loratinib, post-serotinib has loratinib, but not for post-brigatinib, not for post-loratinib. And they are first-line approved. So, 
you can ask the FDA, so what happens if I fail or that? And you know, the FDA says, well, you know, there's nothing approved. And that'll, that'll, be, that'll be all they can say. Um, so I think, I think you have to convince them to have, make sure that they, they test this drug in the setting, you know, post loratinib, post, uh, post uh, brigatinib. I think it's a little bit too late for TPX. They already written the protocol, New Valen, they may be more amenable given that they haven't written their protocol yet. So yeah. Yeah, question um, for Dr. Wait, U, um, okay. that's gonna come out uh, off of the chat. And that is um, in, in the absence of a uh, brain metastasis, would you give um, this person's on lorlatinib, would you add a vast into the uh, carbo alimta with the um, lorlatinib? If, if they progress and no brain mats, depending on the performance status, um, I have done that. I have done that. If they are younger, if they can tolerate, um, yes, I've done that. I don't think they add much. So, but if they if they have bad disease and no brain meds, yes, I, I have done that. So it's it's either carbopamatrexate with or without Vastin. Um, I tend not to be that aggressive at this point. Um, and how, how many cycles of the carbo would you have before you drop it off? I do four and then drop it off. So I measure CEA. I, I measure C on every single patient. So it's mm -hmm. a very good marker. Uh, CEA is actually one of the cheapest marker and you can follow on every blood draw. You don't have to do CT DNA. You don't have to do scans every three months. So I do the marker, the CEA. The CEA drop, I do about four cycles and I stop. I don't do the maintenance. I just, it's more, mostly to reduce the tumor burden and then I go back to the single agent uh, so, so, TKI. So you've mentioned 10 year survival rates and long survival rates, which I think are eye popping for a lot of our guests that we have here. So is it the lorlatinib fails, uh, then you add chemo with the lorlatinib. When I say fails, I'm saying that you have progression. And I guess I have two questions. First question is what is progression? Well, progression is when you have disease growing, especially in the liver. I don't want to wait. Uh, lungs too. So you, you know, any any radiographic evidence of the disease of growing, and and I also double it up with a CEA. So the C is going up, and I can see the CT scan is showing that the tumor is growing. Um, if the size are big, then you, you really have to do something. If the size is still small, one centimeter, well, maybe I'll wait. And how but, about radiotherapy? You know, do, you, do you jump on that with radiation or? No, I, I'm, a, I'm not a huge fan of radiation, uh, especially to the lungs, because it really compromises the lungs for future uh, trials and treatment. You know, you get radiation pneumonitis, you are, you are, you are not eligible for anything else. I mean, all the trials that are, the fourth generation trials, the double mutant positive trials are uh, eliminating patients or not you know, excluding patients who have pneumonitis. So that's going to be a problem. So I don't, I wouldn't, I would, I would hold off any radiation to the chest. Uh, there are other modality you can control, cryoablation, you can even use uh, chemo embolization in the liver if you if you have a very aggressive uh, interventional radiology team at, at your at your hospital. But I hold off on radiation. I'm uh, I'm I'm on that very extreme spectrum of not letting radiation touch the lung because. So how do you extend when you go to lorlatinib? They're failing. They they have a single mutation, not a double mutation. You just keep on extending that out with, uh, hopefully, with chemotherapy that is continuing to work. Yeah, so I would give a few cycles of chemotherapy, make sure it shrinks, and then the C the C A drops down, and then I stop and continue, wait, and then if it starts growing again, I do something different. Uh, like and what? Another chemo. I'm now trying some other, you know. You can potentially try some of the antibody drug conjugate in the future. I think that's a, that's a what what is that antibody? What, what, are, what are you referring to? So there there those are targeted therapies. So you know, one of the one of the very provocative presentation at ASMO this year is from the Daiichi Sankyo 
compound the TROP2 ADC, and they look at, so on their phase one trial, they actually look at patients with EGFR mutations and ARC mutations. Most of them are EGFR mutations and actually got, got out a uh, 30 some percent response rate. It was presented by Eddie Guerin from UCLA. I was actually supposed to get a discussion on that, but ended up just, so well, that's a very provocative, well, here, I'll ask you a question that's in the chat, which is pretty uh, interesting. What is your <laughs> opinion of using an ALK inhibitor with a SHIP2 MEK inhibitor, TRAP2 ADC in post valerolatinib setting for those with out targeted mutations? What would you consider these options before second line chemotherapy? Well, my, my personal experience with SHIP2 inhibitor is a little bit disappointing we have tried we have tried combinate we have used you know we have trials with two different ship two inhibitors they are not as easily tolerable um i know the mgh are doing that we have a trial open also a ship two plus loratinib but i'm not a i i personally is not very high on it not just me i just i just you know <laughs> There's a there's a great question here, and we're running out of time. Do you mind answering one last question, Dr. U? No, sure, I can hang around. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. It, it says the latest Japanese trial shows that progression-free survival is higher um, for insarcinib for variant one and three um, for Asian patients against electinib. Do you know anything about this? Can you comment on that trial? And and sartanib, I'm not aware of that. The ensartanib, uh, variant one is always better than variant three, so it doesn't matter what uh, what you what you uh, you know. Ensartanib is trying to find uh, trying to find a niche. Um, if you look at the JAMA oncology publication, the formal publication, I mean, the subgroup analysis in patients with baseline brain meds did not, you know, the, the progression free survival was not significantly improved and death on the subgroup analysis. So, and ensartanib has rash, so it has a pretty bad rash um, that no other ALK inhibitor has. Um, so I think, I think they're stuck between brigatinib and alactinib, but then loratinib is already here. And then sartinib is still not approved in the US. And another, another problem is they don't have, it's not approved as second line. So nobody has really good experience of giving up and sartinib at all. Um, so none of, so I, I have a feeling that, um, I mean, I haven't seen the data, but I'm, you know, but comparing to an electinib is not the, you know, this should be comparing to a latinib. This should not be comparing to a latinib. Um, I love that you use the CEA markers. I think that Dr. Kamage talked a little bit about that too. He uses those markers as well. Seems like a lot less expensive uh, way to look to see if uh, cancer is growing. Are you an advocate for us doing next-gen sequencing um, upon progression to figure out what's driving cancer with each one of, you know, the, each one of the times that cancer is growing? Yeah, I, I think next generation sequencing is good. I think you, I think the most critical part is to start at the time of diagnosis to have the next gen, the liquid biopsy. Because a lot of patients don't have the liquid biopsy at the time of diagnosis. So you don't know whether they have detectable, detectable CTDNA or not. CEA is actually a fascin it's a fascinating marker. I use it for almost all lung cancer, whether you have driver mutations or not. It works, it works in small cell, it works in mutation negative patients, it works in squamous cell, it works in EGFR, it works in all, especially, it's a very good because it gives you a, a, a sense that you know, something is going up and you need to be careful. And if it drops down, that's good. But if it keeps going up, you know, I know the patient get anxious, but I think this is actually much better than it's a, it's it's a fast it's it's a very good marker because you don't scan it you only scans every three months 
Most yeah. patients are very doing very well. They're asymptomatic. You can't tell what's happening. You can't do liquid biopsy every month. That's that's what, you know somebody has to pay for that. But mm -hmm. CA is a fascinating. It's it's a very good marker. Mm -hmm. It's it's, um, it's one of the best marker there is. I mean, I I never believed that when I first started out. I thought this is just nuts and uh, only the people who don't want to scan. <laughs> you know, do it so that they are lazy. They don't want to scan. They scan every six months or the Japanese like the UCA. But now I completely switch. I think CA mark, I, everybody gets CA mark. Because you, you, when, you, when you go to labs and you get a lot of labs strong when you visit the doctor, you know, you get CBC, you know, protein, albumin, chloride, bicarbonate, but they don't get CA. And I say, you know, this is, this most useless thing I can see is liver enzymes or I'm not saying they're not, but you know, most important one is CEA. You know, I sometimes yeah. I get upset if I even see it was not drawn because I, you know, that's much, this is actually one of the best marker there is. And My guess would be that you get a little bit of opposition from other oncologists about um, testing uh, CEA. I know that my doctor for one says, well, what if it does go up and I don't see where it is and I can't treat anything? So how do you respond to that? Well, it, it, you don't, you don't treat, you don't change the CEA because it, you, don't, you don't change the treatment because CEA, but it gives you something. And if and if you have followed CA enough, it's it's a telltale sign that something is something is not right. You know, it gives you the the proverbial canary in the coal mine. You know, it gets you that you know that thing up there. And if you follow very close, even if your if your CA is ten, it gets you. You know, it it, it is something. Otherwise, you know, you can't. It's it's better that way. I think you know we we're not changing treatment because of CA rights, but it gives you a sense, you know, if a warning if the, sign. <laughs> yeah, if the scans are stable but the CA is going up, I don't change the treatment, but it it makes me look deeper. Maybe I'll I will you know I will I don't change, but it it's something. Usually, it gives you a secondary information. Scan is still the most important. But it gives you a secondary information as to as to as so that you can do it. I don't want to just have one information. Uh, want to to base the treatment, you know, changes in treatment options based on that. So I I like CA. CA is CA CA is a very useful marker in probably ninety percent of the patients. Great. Now, oh, this is another controversial one. What do you think about doing um, lobe surgery on a stage four patient, so advanced stage lung cancer patient? Do you think doing surgery is actually something that could benefit them? I do. I do. I actually do. Uh, if your only site of disease is a nodule in the lung, in let's say in the right upper lobe, and you have bone mats. I think I think it's 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 a possibility, or I wait until the the tumor starts to grow. That's another way of doing it. So you have to this, you have to you have, It all depends on the locations of the tumor. If the left lower lobe, and you have to take out a big chunk of the lung, then that you have to be very careful. If it's the right upper lobe, I think that's much easier. Uh, and also the you still preserve your fun, your lung function. So I'm a I'm a big I'm actually a big fan of that. And you have wedge resection, so you have to you have to you have to judge the situation. If 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 the if the nodule is in the middle of the lung and uh, and and you have to take out the whole lobe, then that's different. If the nodule is on the periphery, and you can do a wedge resection. I actually much prefer wedge resection than radiation. Because number one, you can get the tissue and do more molecular profiling. Radiation, you just radiate and uh, and then you lost it and you're more, you know. Our surgeons, you know, I, I, I know a few surgeons who will do it. So I always refer them to surgeons that will do it. There are surgeons who won't do it. So there are good surgeons who will do it. I, I you know, that's how, that's how you, so I, I'm a, I, I'm not a, I, so I will do it. If, if the circumstances is right, much better than radiation. 
Oh, All right. Well, that is some hope and some, you know, a, a little bit of of just food for thought. You know, if if that were if that offer, I guess um, option was ever presented to us, we would we would have that as an option. It's great to know that that's not something that you're completely against because I think for the past twenty years, that's how long cancer has been. Where stage four was, they won't touch you with a ten foot pole, and so now things. I think people are think rethinking that a little bit. So it's great to hear that that's something that you know that you're in favor of at least rethinking in certain situations and circumstances. So thanks so much. I mean. I think you probably have seen the brigatinib story a few years ago. They show a patient with a nodule that has a G1202R, and then they treat with brigatinib, it shrinks, and they keep showing that nodule. And I said, why don't you just take it out? I mean, instead of, you know, giving brigatinib. <laughs> it's a measurable disease, I understand. In all positive lung cancer, the chance of finding a solitary metastasis is, low, is lower than, let's say, EGFR. So you have to be very careful you have to think about what you're doing because you don't want to compromise lung function so that you can't get onto the next trial and all that. But I, but I routinely don't like to have radiation because any radiation would damage your lungs. And, you know, despite what they claim to be pinpoint radiation, you, you have pneumonitis and then you are out of all the available trials. Surgery, watch resection on the edge, uh, mostly in EGFR mutated lung cancer, they are not as aggressive. The, the, the metastases are, can be just in the lung. Alk is a little bit less, the chance of doing it is less because most patients do have more you know, metastases like in the liver. It's not a, uh, an easy uh, available option that way. But you tend to be aggressive. You want to go after the liver with the chemo embolization with the with the interventional radiology team too. So, uh, yeah. Doctor, we wish we could just download your brain and have like all of that information come onto us. But we thank you so much for your time tonight and all that you have given us, and also your colleague, Doctor Nagasaka, who is also at UCI. We thank you guys so much for being here and. Um, everyone, if you would like to take yourselves off of mute, you can just to thank Dr. O. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. O. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. O, thank you. So we should we should invite Dr. Nakasaka back because I, I spoke over her time, so I, I feel bad. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Nagasaka, we'll, we're happy to stay on if you want if you want to talk more. I think she wants to come in on November, right? You're gonna <laughs> that sounds great. Well, it, everybody have a wonderful Sunday night, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.